Good morning and welcome to Waymaker Fellowship. Pray that you are blessed, those who are here in attendance this morning, those who are watching on Zoom, and for those who have watched this later on YouTube. We just had a very powerful time of worship, unplanned worship, but absolutely the move of God within our lives. This morning, I'm going to be speaking about the motions of life, going through the motions. And I'm coming out of a familiar passage found in the Gospels, Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to the end of the chapter, which I will read in just a few moments. But before I start, I want to remind you of a movie that we all saw probably years ago called Groundhog Day. And if you remember the movie Groundhog Day, Bill Murray is a cynical news reporter who gets trapped on that day, Groundhog Day, and continues to get trapped on that day until he makes an internal change. In other words, he kept waking up every morning and it was Groundhog Day. He never ever advanced. And we see through the movie him doing things in his life, learning how to play the piano, learning how to cook, all these different dynamics. But it wasn't until he finally resolved that deep issue within his life that he was able to move on. And I wonder at times, how many of us are going through Groundhog Day? We're just going through the same old, same old, same old, same old. You get up in the morning, you get dressed, you go to church, you worship, you listen to the sermon, you go home, and there is no change. Week in, week out, week day, week, da week, week day, in and out, but there's no change. You're just going through the motion. And the story that I'm going to read this morning out of the Gospel of Mark tells the story of a man who was blind. And I want you to really pick up what he had to do to get out of that everyday blindness. And I want you to give thought in your life. Are there areas of your life that you're just going through the motion? In other words, your relationship with God has stagnated in some aspects. Or maybe your relationship with your family, or maybe your husband or your wife. Surely we do understand in the church, I understand as a pastor and a counselor, how often marriages go through the motion. And there's all kinds of rationales and reasons for it. The stresses of life, the children, the jobs, health, all these line items. But I'm firmly convinced that your marriage can be a marriage that every day is brand new. And that if you allow God to rule your life, not your spouse's, but yours, then you can see new life every day in your marriage. You can see it every day in your parenting. You can see it every day with the people that you interact with, that you work with, that you're around, that know you. In other words, beloved, life doesn't have to be dull, gray, and boring, and going through the dum-dums or the doldums of life. You don't have to stay in a place that just seems to be no change. So we're going to speak about some points of how to get out of the motion this morning. But before I do, I want you to look at your text. In Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to the end of the chapter, they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a large crowd, Bartonimus, the son of Tinnimus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out, Son of David, Jesus, have mercy on me. Many people told him to keep quiet, but he was crying out all the more, Have mercy on me, son of David. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man and said to him, have courage, get up, he's calling for you. He threw off his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. Then Jesus answered him, what do you want me to do for you? Rabbi Bonai, the blind man, told him, I want 
to see. Go your way, Jesus told him. Your faith has healed you. Immediately, he could see and began to follow him on the road. When I read this text, and particularly when I read it in the Greek, there are some points that come out of the absolute persistence of this blind man. So I want you to sit for a moment. We're going to go back in time in our time capsule to the days of Jesus. He's in Jericho. You remember Jericho. It's a city that Joshua destroyed by the power of Almighty God when they entered the Promised Land. The city that was considered unbeatable was destroyed by God in a very unique way. And so here we have a blind man. We do not know how old he is, but he's been sitting at the side of the road for years begging. They didn't have on medical insurance or state providing or disability acts or anything of that nature in the days of Jesus. There was nothing that the government would do for a person with disabilities. If you were blind, you had to beg unless you had a large family that was very wealthy that could provide for you. And so this man sat at the side of the road, no different than the man who was lame that Peter and John in the book of Acts healed in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. You remember that story. So there's a blind man is sitting there and he is begging. Now, it's a begging no different than the begging that's spoken of in Acts in the Greek, that it was a constant litany. It was a constant statement. He didn't just look. He couldn't see anybody coming. So he's holding what he has, and he's begging, please give to me, give to me, give to me, give to me, give to me. And it's a constant statement. There is no pauses. The only pauses that he gives is for breathing. And throughout the entire day, tonight, from morning to night, he is begging upon the generosity and the goodness of the people that pass by that city. And now I want you to think about the good Samaritan of the Samaritan who helps the man who was robbed, laying by the road, and yet the priest and the Levite did nothing. So we're not living in a very generous time. We're not, we're not living where money is easy. We're living in a time where Palestine was under Roman rule, and they were taxing the people greatly. So this man is living off the generosity of the kind-hearted people who are coming by. And yet Old Testament teaching taught that you were to give. In fact, if you want to talk just for a moment about tithing, Old Testament teaching of tithing is not 10% only. 10% went to the temple, 10% went to the priesthood, and every other year, 10% went to the orphans and the widows. So before you get up and you start declaring that 10% is the only answer and you must give 10%, I need to remind you it's actually 20% and 30%. New Testament teaches us, listen, to give out the goodness of our hearts. That's what Jesus taught. And that could be any percent, but it's what God speaks to your heart. And in that day and time, in the days of Jesus, the people held on to the money no different than a Scotsman would hold on to a penny. So here this man is going every day. We don't know how he gets out there. We don't know if anybody's helping him, but he ends up on the outskirts of Jericho. In other words, he's outside of the city gates. The scripture says Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd was leaving. Jericho. So he may have been at the gate, one side or the other, but he's there at the exit point of Jericho. And he is begging every day for his livelihood. He's begging every day, going through the motion. We remember the famous commercial that they had about uh, the donuts, Dunkin' Donuts, the guy getting up, and what did he say? I'm going to make the donuts. And the next day, going to make the donuts. In fact, I even say that at times as I get up to go to the emergency department early in the morning, I'll tell my beloved, honey, I'm going to make the donuts. In other words, I'm going through the motions of going into an emergency department 
doing the same thing day in and day out. We all can relate to this sermon. And if you're telling me you can't relate, then I want to know what world you're living in. Because we all go through this time in life, in areas of our life, in relationships in our life, in our relationship with our God, that we just go through the motions. In fact, there's a famous Christian song, Going Through the Motions. And what does that really mean to us? It means literally, it means doing the same thing over and over again to live out a constant routine to live a life in a constant rut. It's to never change for the better. And I wonder how often the church has fallen into this trap. And I wonder how often you and I have. And I'm going to pause there because I really want you to think about it. Are you going through the motions with God? Is God just becoming the same old, same old? Is reading the scriptures becoming boring? Is your prayer time becoming less? Is it you is your worship time becoming more of what you want versus what God says? More the style of songs that you want than what God may have. Are you sitting in church analyzing everything, critiquing everything? Do you go in the church with the mindset, here comes another boring sermon? When can I go and watch my football game? Are you secretly watching your cell phone during the football game, watching the scores and not listening to the sermon? What about your relationships? Beloved, society says that the honeymoon lasts a year. You've heard me say this over and over and over. The honeymoon can be every day. It's all about you and God, not you and your spouse. In fact, to be honest with you, if you're looking at me right now and listening to me right now saying, I'm going through the motions because of my spouse, that is a lie. You're going through the motions because you choose to go through the motions, and it's about you and God. But you don't understand. I don't need to. But you don't know what I live with. I don't have to. What I do know is what the Bible says. New are his mercies every morning. New is God every morning. Renew your mind every day. And if we did those two principles, then everything that we encounter would be new every day. But my marriage is boring. But my marriage is this. But my children are that. Those are not excuses for what is happening within your heart. It's all about you. When we go through the motions, we will never truly experience God or his power. I'm going to say that again because I want you to really get this, write it down somewhere, tattoo it on your forehead. I don't care. When you go through the motions, you will not encounter God's power or experience who he is. And that's critical. What happens is life becomes a cookie cutter, the same old, same old. So when we are stuck going through the motions, when we are stuck going through Groundhog Day, when you are stuck in an environment and a circumstance that you do not like, how do you get out of it? Number one, listen carefully. You must take responsibility for your own life. That is point number one. Write it down somewhere. You must take responsibility for your own life. Notice I didn't say your family. I didn't say your spouse. I didn't say your coworker. I said your own life. You see, the blind man heard the people coming. It is said in medicine that if you lose one of your senses, that the other senses become very hyperactive. So traditionally, blind people have better hearing. And he hears the tramp of the crowd. He hears Jesus coming. He hears them talking. And he hears what's going on. And he, when he asks, who is this? They tell him it's Jesus. And what does he do? He cries out. He doesn't care about decorum. He doesn't care about what is proper. He didn't go to finishing school. He just shouted out, son of David. And that declaration, he's declaring Jesus is the Messiah. The Greek here indicates 
that he didn't just say it once. He kept saying it. Son of David, 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 son of David. And by now you're irritated by me. You probably turned me off, turned the volume off. But imagine, he kept crying it out. The imperative is that he kept commanding. It's an imperative command. He kept crying out to get his attention. Beloved, the first step is we've got to take responsibility of our own life, and we must cry out to God for him to do what? Not heal your co-workers, not change your co-workers, not change your children, not change your dog, not change your husband or your wife, but to change you. If you're in the process of going through the motions, it isn't a we thing, it's a you thing. Years ago, when I was a brand new pastor, I thought all marital counseling was a we thing. And I quickly learned as I counseled, it's not always a we. Sometimes it is. It's a you. It's a me. It's an I. But not everything's a we. In fact, to be honest, and this is going to be spoken to so many of you who are listening, who have been hurt by divorce. Divorce is not always a we thing. It's a person thing. And many of you who've been damaged by divorce and had no say, had no ability to change it because of the laws of our land, it isn't about you, it's about the person who did it. Listen to me carefully. Whatever has happened in your life, whatever you are going through today, whatever the events may be, whatever strongholds you have in your life, whatever is in you right now, Jesus Christ can heal you and set you free if you will call upon the son of David. But you must do that. And so when he heard it was Jesus, as I said, he kept crying out. He chose not to go through the motion and remain blind. He had heard about this Jesus who had healed. So you must take responsibility for yourself. This is a message about you, about me, not about our neighbor, not about the other people in the room or in the pew or in the row or in the church, not about your spouse or your children or your dog, cat, fish, or bird. It's about you. You have to admit, we all get stuck going through the motion. We all get stuck in our personal lives. We all get stuck in our professional lives. We all get stuck in our spiritual lives. And we all get stuck in our church lives. That is part of the Adamic nature. The fact is, going through the motion is not the problem. The problem is you staying there. You're not being honest enough to acknowledge and admit that you're the one doing it and you need Jesus' help to get out of it. That's what's critical. Point two, believe that change is possible. I don't know how many Christians I've talked to through the years who look at me and I will never and say, I'll never change. It's the way I am. It's my personality. It's blah, blah, and blah, and blah. And guys and gals, listen to me. Jesus can change anyone. Don't bite into the lie of the Adamic nature and Satan that would keep you trapped. Don't blame your circumstances on anyone else. Oh, they might be contributing, but they are not the ones who are going to stand with you in front of Jesus. It'll just be you. Take responsibility for your own life. Believe that you can change because God wants to change you. Because Jesus asked him, the question, what do you want? And he said, I want to see. I think about that. Jesus is here right now, speaking to your heart by the Holy Spirit. What do you want? And I want you to write down on a sheet of paper right now. Take the step of faith. Write it out on a sheet of paper. Don't just sit there and stare at me. And tell Jesus what you want to get out of the motion. What is it that you want? And dare not write a new husband or a new wife. Dare not write new children. 
That's not the answer. It's about you. What is it that Jesus can do for you? And what he said is, I want to see. He believed that there was still hope in his life. Because you see, if Jesus did not heal him, he would have remained a beggar, blind, for the remainder of the years of his life. And if Jesus does not heal you, you will remain in the condition that you are in right now. If Jesus does not deliver you, you will remain in the condition you are in right now. This is a message of great hope, of great joy. You have at your fingertips, you have just the simple cry of your heart, the ability to touch the very God or the very God who can change your life right now. All you have to do is ask, and he will break the powers that are in your life right now to set you free, that you not go through the motions. Groundhog Day needs to just be one day, not your life. Clarify what you really need. Don't give a bland, grand, blah statement. Don't give a generalized statement. Be honest. You need to tell God what you really want. Don't make a list. Rabbi, I, I, I want to be able to see, and, and I would like a castle, and I would like 50 camels, and, and 40 sheep, and 30 donkeys, and 100 chickens, and, and I, I, I would like to have a, a beautiful wife who is uh, five foot two and um, eyes are blue and, uh, and blonde hair, which didn't happen in that day. You know, that was up in Norway, that area of the world. But anyways, and, 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 I, want, uh, and, and I want them to have this and that. Don't make a list. Deal with what the real issue is. What's really going on? Be honest. You know, it's like sometimes when I get patients that come to me in the emergency department, right? They got 55 complaints. 54 of them are chronic complaints that they've had for years. The one is the acute complaint that I need to deal with. I'm not going to deal with the other 54. I'm going to tell them to go see their primary doctor. We're in an emergency department. I'm not here to deal with your back problem that you've had for 10 years. I'm not here to deal with the rash you've had for three, three weeks. Though we will do what we need to do. Go see your primary. That's what you ought to do. What is the acute reason? We will always ask the patient, what brings you to the emergency department today? And sometimes we'll say this. So what makes today the day to come? Because we're trying to get past the chronic to the acute. God wants to get past your chronic problems to the acute. What is causing you right now to go through the motions with God or the motions of life? What has robbed you of your joy, your peace, your strength? And if you look at me today and you point anywhere else, then you have not gotten the grasp of what this message is because it's all about you and I. You need to know that God can deliver you from anything. You need to know that God can break any power in your life, any stronghold in your life. And don't be praying, oh God, what I need again is a new whatever. It's you. Next point, don't worry about what others might say. When he started crying out, son of David, people were basically telling him to shut up. Don't worry about him. There are people in the church that literally are in the way. I don't mean in the way like the biblical aspect. I mean they're in the way, you know, in the way of you growing, in the way of you encountering God, in the way of you experiencing God, in the way of you doing what God wants. They're just literally in the way. Don't let the in the way people stop you from pursuing God. There are churches, if you raise your hand, you'll be frowned at. Those churches need a revival. They're going through the motions. As long as you're doing it unto God and is honorable, do what God wants you to do in your spirit. There are churches out there that speak strongly against the Pentecostal expression and the charismatic. And though there are some 
liberties in some of that aspect that they need to rein it in some, biblically speaking. You need to be free. I spoke about that last week and the week before. Be free. Don't let people stop you from calling upon the one that you love, that you need, that you're desperate for. Don't let worry about other what others say. The Greek here says he was charged to be silent. That means they rebuked him, censored him severely, told him, hold your peace, be silent, don't speak. It is it's an heiress form of the Greek that speaks of a new condition. In other words, they're talking, they're all talking about what Jesus is doing, being around the Savior, and all of a sudden they hear this voice, Son of David, 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 Son of David. And they all changed what they were doing to rebuke him. Thank the Lord. The blind man didn't st stop crying out for the Son of David, because if he did, he'd be blind today. And sometimes, beloved, we allow other people to censor us to rebuke us in our crying out to the one that can save us. And that is wrong every time. Ignore them. If they're in your relationships, let them go. You do not need people in the way of your relationship with Jesus Christ. He wants you to live a life that is living every day. Many rebuked him. But what I'm glad is that he did not at any point, listen to them. Praise God. There are people that tell me how I should pastor. There are people that tell me how I should hold worship. There are people that tell me how to preach and teach. But the only one that can truly do that is the one that loves me. And that's Jesus. People are fickle. We've learned that already. I've had church people look at me at the end of a message as I greeted them leaving the church. Great message, Pastor. The next one, great message, Pastor. The worship was too long. Great. Next one, Pastor, the worship was too short. Next one, Pastor, your Greek was awesome. You need more. Next one, Pastor, I like your Greek, but you need less. If I listened to the church people on how to walk with Jesus, I would end up in, a, in an institution, in a psychiatric ward, having no clue of who I am. Don't let people tell you. I've had Christians in churches praise God for what I'm doing and weeks later hate me. People are fickle because we all have an endemic nature and we can all be carnal. You cannot allow people to influence or to drown out the voice of God. Who has the most influence in your life? People or God? Next point. Stop waiting for the right circumstances. It, in, in history, the Quakers were well known to be people that wait upon the move of God. In fact, the sign language for Quaker is twiddling your thumb. That's actually the sign. And it's fascinating because what they're conveying is they're just sitting there waiting. Now, there is a season of waiting. There's no doubt upon that. There is a season where God will separate you at times to speak to you, but he never separates you from the church. He never separates you from the people of God. And if you believe in something of that, that he does, you're wrong biblically. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. You don't wait for the right circumstances. The right circumstances wasn't there for the blind man. Jesus is with a group of people. He's leaving the city. He's on a mission. But the need of that blind man trumped the right circumstances. And beloved, there is never going to be the right circumstances to call upon God. It's the urgency. It's the need. It is now. He sees the moment. And life is precious. And every moment is important. And we don't want to lose a day just going through the motions with God or anyone else. Now, before I go on to my final points, I need to make a real good point. Are you listening? Here it is. 
you cannot look at me today and say this, Pastor, my relationship with God is awesome. It's life-giving, ever-changing. But my relationships at church is going through the motion. What happens vertically happens horizontally. What happens horizontally happens vertically. You cannot tell me you've got a great relationship with God, and yet you're sitting there going through the motion, doing worship, listening to the sermon, the prayer group, fellowship. You're in the church, and you're looking at your clock, waiting for the guy to get done so you can leave. You're going through the motion. But i got a great relationship with God. No, you don't. And I challenge you. I challenge you to come back at me and show me scripturally that I'm wrong. You cannot look at me today and say, I'm okay with God, but I hate my wife. I despise my husband. Those little people that you gave me, why? That is not true Christianity. What the Father does through you and in you goes horizontally to everybody you meet. You cannot go and have a great time of worship at God, get in your car and have an argument in the parking lot. Curse someone out because they took off before you. I'll never forget a time I was at Bible college and I was directing traffic as part of my responsibility as 11,000 people left. And I can't tell you how many of these Christians that I watched worship, praise God, hands up, go to the altar, curse at me, flip me off, try to run me over because I stopped them to let another car go. I call that shallow Christianity. I call that Christianity that is of no true value. It's an emotional yo-yo, and you don't have the depths, and you're going to church on Sunday, and you are a heathen in that parking lot. You can't look at me and say, ooh, wow, I had a great prayer meeting. The Holy Ghost moved, and people were slain in the Spirit, and people got healed and delivered, and I got in the car, and I had road rage. You can't look at me and say, I had a great time of prayer when your husband comes home from work and I had a great time of Bible study. The next thing you know, there is Mount St. Helens at your home. Because what that really communicates to me is that nothing substantial stuck. You are like Teflon. Whoop, whoop. And God is all about relationship that's deep and intimate. So stop waiting for the right circumstances. Do something that is bold. What did he do? He got up and he came to Jesus. This is a blind man moving to Jesus. I need to share something with you. My eyesight sometimes is tricky, particularly with bright lights. There are times my wife, and there's a time that my wife and I went to the OC um, fair, and it was so bright, I literally could not really see. I literally was within feet of her because I could see her, but I couldn't see anything else. There's no way in the world I was going to lead and take off running. I hit something. Here's a blind man. Got up, grabbed his clothes, and took off for Jesus. And that's what you need to do today. So what is the key to this personal renewal? One, you need to put your focus on Christ. Two, you need to place your focus on Christ. Can you guess the third one? Three, you need to place your focus on Christ. It will renew your faith, renew your desire, and renew your enthusiasm. And you need to keep on focusing on Christ. Every day, every moment. Not just when it's convenient, not when you're just having one of those glory moments, not just when your husband or your wife comes home or your children come home from school, the dog does something on your floor. Every day, every moment. I wonder how many relationships would turn around if we just did what I'm preaching today. Going through the motions of a marriage, going through the motions of parenting, going through the motions of work, going through the motions of being at home, going through the motions when God says life is wonderful with him. He can change every storm into a rainbow. He can change your life. Do it right now. You know, one of the beautiful things about Jesus is Jesus did not ignore him. I'm sure the disciples were part of the crowd telling him to be quiet. 
We've seen him act that way before. I want to share something with you. It's a promise from God. He will never ignore you. He will never abandon you. He'll never forsake you. He loves you. I tell my Bible study at the hospital every Wednesday morning, God loves you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what's happened in your life. It doesn't matter if the medical condition is caused by you. God loves you. And God loves you. He doesn't want you stuck in an endless rut. He doesn't want you stuck going around in a circle. He wants you to be honest with him. He wants you to take ownership, responsibility, seize the moment, cry out, declare what you need, go boldly to him and receive the healing you need. The blind man was healed. And notice the last part of the, of the verses I read. He was healed and began following Jesus. When's the last time God touched your heart and healed you and you followed Jesus? By the way, just so you know this, this is the last recorded healing that took place before Jesus died. I wanted to share that with you because that brings home what I just said earlier. If he had not cried out to Jesus, he'd be blind to his death. Jesus is on his way to the cross. This is the last recorded healing in scriptures prior to the crucifixion. Jesus healed a man because the man cried out to him. Jesus wants to heal you. Jesus wants to deliver you. Jesus wants to set you free. Jesus wants to bring all the colors back into your life. But you've got to call out. You've got to act. Because if you don't, you're going to remain right where you're at today. And you cannot blame anyone. What would happen if he just got, kept going through the motion? Absolutely nothing. He would never regain his sight. He would have been begging for the remainder of his life, hoping upon the goodness of people coming through that city. What about it? Will you be brave enough today to take time today to find a quiet place today and be honest to God to acknowledge? Will you stop making excuses in your relationships with God? Will you be willing to say, Lord, it's me. I need to change. I want to change. I'm willing to change. And would you allow God to give you that change every day? So often we do this and God does move. And so often we slip right back into the same old rut we were in. Because you know what, beloved? The ruts are easy to live in. It's predictable. You know what's going to happen. But let's live a life of unpredictability. Let's live a life that is wild and crazy in God. Let's not live in comfort and peace that it's our making. Let's live in the peace that God gives in the midst of a storm. Let's believe God for the unbelievable. Let's believe God that God can use us to change a world, to change a neighborhood, to change a family. Stop making excuses throughout everything that you do. Be honest, open, and intimate to the ones that you love, most of all, to the one that loves you, that's him. I pray that God will bless you. I pray that you will take these messages that I've been preaching through the year to heart. I really want to hear what God is doing. I have a comment section now on my YouTube. Leave a comment. Tell me what you think. Just be Christ-like. And may God's peace and blessings be with you. Amen.